know, we have a Bioswell presentation. Fabulous stars for our presentation are, I'll go left to right, I'll go Stephen Mahoney, who is a member of large of Eastern Long Island Surf Riders Foundation. Stephen is also founder and owner and operator of Mahoney Farm, grower of nursery stock in East Hampton. He is also a pioneer of wind power. And he's using the best management skills for farming. Then we have Colleen Penn. Colleen is a surf rider uh, coordinator for 50 plus Blue Water Task Force Lab across North America, assisting with the growth and uh, labs, coordinating logistics and water quality data to the public. She also coordinates Eastern. Last but not least, we have Tony Piazza. After a formal design education at Cornell University, Tony became a horticulturist and formed the Southampton-based Piazza Horticultural Group in 1998. He serves on the Longhouse Committee and the Parish Art Museum Landscape Committee. And he's also designer and award-winning designer of our East Hampton Green Bioswell Project, which is now we would like to go on in that phase two of the bio as well and <laughs> Thanks, Patty. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Tony Piazza, and we actually had introductions prepared, so you're going to hear a little more. Um, I'm the founder of Piazza Horticultural Group, which is a landscape design and build firm, and I'm the principal of that group. Um, our company is dedicated to linking our clients' properties and their lives and their lifestyles to their natural surroundings through the landscape arts. Um, we're a toxin-free management company, which means that um, we don't use any chemicals to manage the landscapes that we work on. And um, we're very <clears throat> sort of tuned into the environmental impacts of everything we do in that management. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, I have an amazing team of about 30 people behind me on staff I can't do this all alone. And um, we have environmentalists, scientists, skilled horticulturists, and design professionals that all support me in what I do. Um, and next we have Stephen Mahoney. Uh, I'm the founder, owner, and operator of Mahoney Farm. We uh, grow trees and shrubs for the wholesale market. Uh, we, we sell locally into and into New York and throughout the uh, the Northeast and to select markets. Um, in 2009, I reintroduced small wind power to East Hampton. Um, our nursery runs on 100% of our electrical needs are uh, supplied by our wind turbine. Uh, we subscribe to best management practices, which are cost-effective ways to conserve water, manage nutrients, and control to prevent runoff and leaching. Uh, at the same time, it produces quality results. Um, it's a it's a win win. So we're very dedicated to that. And I am Colleen Hen. I am the Eastern Long Island chapter of the Surf Rider Foundation's chapter coordinator. So I help the chapter run its programs and campaigns for clean water and healthy beaches. And I also help coordinate a network of citizen science water testing labs across the country. Okay. So fair warning. Um, the word amazing seems to be my word this year, so you're going to hear it about 2,000 <laughs> times. Sorry about that. I tried to delete it, but I couldn't. Um, as I mentioned, in my company, I have a, an amazing team, and um, I wanted to mention the team that went into this project, too, while well, we had a second. Um, the um, East Hampton Ladies' Village Improvement Society, Mahoney Farms, Surf Rider Foundation, and Piazza Horticultural Group were the... Um, <laughs> people that came together for the design and implementation of the project, and we couldn't have done it without financial support from the Michelle Walworth Foundation and the KW Cassidy Foundation. So let's begin with a brief history of the Village Green um, over time, starting like in the early 1700s. Well, actually, it was in 1653 when um, the town voted to uh, dig a watering hole for cows, which is now known as the town pond. And the East Hampton Star wrote that for the next 200 years, it was a muddy mess. 
Um, and further uh, along in history, in August of 1913, the Women's Suffrage League rallied on the Green for the right to vote. And the LVIS fair was held on the Green for many years until it moved to Mulford Farm and then on to the present LVIS headquarters. In the in the 80s and 90s, it was a, a highly managed uh, lawn, a nice green spread. Um, and at the turn of, of the millennium, it, uh, it turned toxic-free. A uh, toxic -free, toxin-free lawn care program was initiated. And that was a really a progressive effort to protect the watershed. Now it's 2019, and the Village Green has a beautiful functioning bioswale that reflects the current culture and the needs of the community through the seemingly unlikely partnership of the LVIS and the Eastern Long Island Surf Riders Foundation. <laughs> OK. So one of the most important things we want to get across to you today is that we are within a watershed. No matter where you go, you are within a watershed. And no matter what you do affects that watershed. So NOAA's definition of a watershed is a land area that channels rainfall and snow melt to creeks, streams, rivers, and eventually to outflow points, such as re reservoirs, bays, and the ocean. So you can think of a watershed as basically a funnel that channels all fresh water into the same water body. Um, some watersheds are really small. We're in a relatively small watershed here, but other watersheds extend hundreds of square miles inland. Um, this is where we are today. We are within the Hook Pond watershed. Um, so you can see that little leaf in the middle. That is where we planted the uh, bioswale. Um, and we did that in an effort to protect, obviously, the, the village green itself. But the village green is connected to the town pond in heavy rains. The town pond is connected to Hook Pond hydrologically, meaning underground. And Hook Pond is connected to Main Beach through an outfall pipe. So this is a really, really upstream approach to not only protecting the Hook Pond, Town Pond water, um, watershed, but also Main Beach, which, which obviously brings in so, so, so much revenue for this town each year. So unfortunately, there are a lot of threats to this watershed. And that's partially why we are here today. Um, stormwater and urban runoff can pick up bacteria, animal waste, road dust, chemicals, fertilizers. So after a huge rain, all of those pollutants are being brought downstream into the watershed. Um, sewage infrastructure failures are something, unfortunately, we know all too well out here. A lot of our wastewater systems are very outdated. We out here have an issue with septic systems in the city. It's sewers. Um, Traditional landscaping practices cause a lot of pressure to these watersheds because it is inputting excess water and excess nutrients, which can fuel harmful algal blooms. And also, improperly irrigated lawns and properties can cause a threat to the watershed. Why is that, Tony? <laughs> well, let me tell you, Kali. <laughs> um, so here's a very beautiful, perfect looking lawn, but not really a perfect lawn. You can see that it's. It's a monoculture of one kind of grass. Um, and the problem with um, this particular grass, which is most likely bluegrass, is that it likes to grow in very cold, wet conditions, like right now, the spring we're having. So um, most lawns are very happy up until about the middle of July when the temperatures go up and the rain stops. And then they start to go into stress. So in our community, the middle of July is sort of high season. The lawn has to look good, right? Um, so what do we do? Traditionally, we have added a lot of water, thinking that it needed a lot of water to grow. And we've done a lot of inputs, like so water-soluble nitrogen. Um, so with all those things, the grass is going to grow. But it's going to grow in a very unhealthy manner, where it's relatively soft, I, I, horticulturally soft, where the, the growth is just kind of flimsy and not sturdy like it is in the spring. And soft growth is leads um, plant material open to pathogens like funguses, bacterias. Um, insects can smell it for miles. And they're like, ah, weak plant. Let's go get it. So what do we do to control all of that? Put down fungicides, put down insecticides. And all of, um, as we're talking, you know, all of us live in a watershed. So what happens to all those things that we're putting down to keep our lawn green? 
they enter the watershed one way or another, either through groundwater or runoff during a rainstorm. I have a stat. <laughs> I love stats. <laughs> Every year in the U.S., 7 billion, watt, 7 billion gallons of drinkable fresh water is used for irrigation, and over half of that becomes runoff. So irrigated lawns can be a big water waster. So how does this affect you? Here's how. The result of mismanaged water manifests itself in the form of public health concerns. We're talking about beach closures as a result of stormwater runoff. We're talking about shell fishing and gill fishing closures. We're talking about, and this is the most important thing to everyone who lives in this community, loss of coastal economy. This photo here was taken in September of 2018 um, after a red tide, after a red tide in, or during a red tide in Palm Beach County, Florida. I don't know how many people have heard of that. This was one of the most tragic red tides that they're seeing more and more and more. Um, and as of August this year, they had lost $8 million in revenue from coastal businesses alone. So we are looking at huge public health concerns. And the reason they're wearing masks is because this red tide had a toxic compound that was becoming airborne because it was so abundant. So this is really serious, kind of scary stuff. But we are also here to give you solutions. Um, this really hit home a couple years ago. The problems of our local ponds have of experiencing um, blue green algae, cyanobacteria blooms have really kind of uh, reached the surface the past couple of years. And unfortunately, it's becoming the new norm. <laughs> um, every year, we're seeing, seeing warmer and warmer water. And that means new algae is being found that are very, very, very dangerous to human health. Um, and beach closures and all around, we do not want this in our water bodies. And we're not alone in experiencing this. Um, these are all of the water quality impairments that, were, that, were, uh, that we experienced on Long Island during summer 2018. Um, but we decided to take action here locally by building a bioswale. So, Tony, Ooh, what's what? a bioswale? What is a bioswale? Bioswale is a fancy word for a ditch, a drainage ditch. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, uh, the, the definition is up here on the screen. Bioswales bio are landscape elements designed to concentrate, remove debris and pollution out of surface runoff water. Um, this little diagram here shows sort of like a dual purpose. Bioswale, it's, um, with, you can see that it's showing water coming off of a residence that would normally run off somewhere. So in this example, they, they show that runoff water going into what's called a sand wick. So it's taking the water from the surface and bringing it right down into the water table. And then it also shows rainwater, which would create runoff, and how it could be captured and slowed down for percolation through plantings and the habitat and stuff that's created by it. Other names for bioswales are rain gardens, native gardens, or ocean-friendly gardens. Um, but I'm serious about the ditch thing. When I was a kid, I grew up in rural upstate New York, and the roads had ditches on the sides. And those ditches were dug and left alone. And eventually, Mother Nature deposited wetlands in them, basically. So as the water shut off the roads, it was basically filtered by native plant material before it hit the watershed. Um, so we wanted to take a second to talk about bioswales in urban settings because a lot of the, the people in this area are also in the city a lot. This is an, an example of a, an urban, a design for an urban bioswale where the, the storm water is you know, mostly running down the streets. So in this design, the curbs have cuts into them and the water is allowed to pass into this depression in the, in the um, sidewalk. And kind of get absorbed or slow down just as it did in a traditional bioswale and hopefully clean before it comes back out and hits the gutter um, and then eventually goes right straight into the water table. Um, so here's a, you know, there, were quite a, there was quite a bit of funding for this in the city and here's one planted. Um, looks just like it does in the pictogram? Info. Info. No, no, that's a diagram. It's a diagram. Diagram, okay. <laughs> Um, so, you know, there's a tree in the middle planted with all the great plants that would attract habitat and stuff. So what does this do for the city? It decreases runoff, um, 
collects debris, it creates wildlife, ha wildlife habitat, purifies the air, cools an urban environment, and it's, it's pretty. Without that there, you'd be staring at a, a white wall, which isn't terrible, but plants make everybody happy. Um, but we're here today, to, here today to talk about a rural bioswale, which is right across the street from where we're sitting right now. And I'd like to turn it over to Stephen to talk about the genesis of the Village Green Bioswale. So how did the Village Green Bioswale come about? Um, in March of 2016, uh, a group of like-minded people met in my kitchen uh, to discuss ways to raise community awareness of how landscape practices affect water quality in our watershed. Um, and we, we wanted to implement uh, the uh, Eastern Long Island Surf Riders Ocean Friendly Garden Program. And Ocean Friendly Garden pro Program sees landscapes and streets as solutions to water pollution uh, through filtering of, in a bioswale. So we had, a, we had a, a small donation to build a small demonstration garden um, and then contacted the LVIS to see if there was any available green space uh, that we might plant this garden that people could see and um, look at and touch and feel and everything. And when we met, uh, Ann Thomas, the LVIS president at the time, suggested we plant the garden on the Village Green, which kind of floored us because the, uh, the project, it was much more than uh, we anticipated or had the funds for. Um, but we were really excited because it just sounded really cool. And the, but at the same time, we were intimidated because the Village Green was so iconic and we felt that we better do it right, otherwise <laughs> everybody would have something to say. Um, <laughs> so it was quite daunting, but we, uh, we, we pushed ahead. And um, we raised funds, and uh, May, Tony drew up a design, and um, the Kate Cassidy Foundation came up with the needed funds, and um, we uh, forged ahead. With our Ocean Friendly Gardens program. What is an Ocean Friendly Garden, you might ask? The Ocean Friendly Gardens program is Surfrider Foundation's um, sustainable landscaping and education program that provides beautiful, inexpensive, and natural solutions to the problems caused by stormwater runoff. This program helps us connect what we do and how we care for our yards and how that affects our watersheds and our water bodies. Ocean Friendly Gardens fe feature native, climate appropriate plants that do not need to be treated with chemicals or fertilizers because they're growing in the soil they're meant to be growing in. Um, Ocean Friendly Gardens are shaped and created to slow, spread, and sink water before it becomes urban runoff. And by doing that, it also traps sediments, reduces runoff and flooding, filters out pollutants, provides a wildlife habitat, it builds healthy soils naturally, and more and more science has been coming out about how soil itself sequesters carbon. So it's helping us in the face of climate change. Most importantly, they are very beautiful. So let's dive in. So uh, there are several parties involved in the Village Green Bioswale. So the East Hampton Village owns the Village Green. The East Hampton Highway Department oversees the Village Green. The LVIS maintains Village Green, and then the Eastern Long Island Surf Rider Foundation comes in and raises the funds and arranges for the design and the installation of the Village Green Bioswale. So Tony designed uh, and we presented a plan to uh, an enthusiastic village board, which was really great. We raised the funds, as I said, um, through the Kate W. Cassidy Foundation in the fall of 2016. Then the village contracted uh, all the excavation and seeding. If, you, if any of you remember back then, they, they did all this work and then winter came and there was a it was a really wet winter and there was a tremendous amount of water that was going through the village green and it, it was running through a, really a fresh and unstable project. And 
we, we were watching this along with everybody else, and uh, it made us quite anxious because we, we just didn't know if, if, if these plants were going to just flow right down into Town Pond, and that would be it. <laughs> and um, so the, the, the Village Highway Department worked very, worked very hard tweaking and uh, just getting the projects, project uh, making adjustments and just getting it right uh, so that we could properly plant it. And we moved ahead. We were hoping for drier weather and uh, just hoping that things would turn out right for us. And they eventually did. <coughs> okay, so this is the original plan. Um, yikes, what a, what a daunting task. I really was afraid to touch the village green. I, I'll never forget that meeting with at LVIS. I knew it was too early for cocktails, but I thought, did Ann just say, let's plant the village green? <laughs> and um, if any of you know Ann Thomas, she's very frank, and she said, let's plant the village green. So um, I, I went about you know, thinking about this project with some very specific design imperatives. Um, I wanted it to be a superlative example to the local residents because I wanted um, people, especially people that lived waterfront, to see that they could do buffer zones that didn't have to look like a tangle of weeds um, with the same amount of input almost that they would put into managing lawn in that area, they could um, do a planting that would serve the environment much better, be beautiful. So that was like my most, you know, most important thing. I wanted it to be as colorful as possible because we're all stimulated by color. This is a summer community, and I wanted people to leave here in the fall with happy smiles on their face when they drove through East Hampton Village. Um, I wanted it to be as deer resistant as possible, because believe it or not, we do have deer on the Village Green. I wanted it to have four seasons of interest, um, low maintenance, and most of all, I wanted it to function. Um, habitat. You know, wildlife habitat would have been great, but it's, you can see it's sandwiched in between three roads. So um, that wasn't super important, but I did the best I could. Um, and, you know, it, it was, this is a community that's very passionate about its surroundings. You know, and, and going into a project like this, you know that there are going to be naysayers and, um, you know, just you never know where people are going to come out of the woodwork and what they're going to say. So. It was interesting that we had some skepticism in the beginning that by August was sort of dissipated. Um, so I'm going to move on to just, I, there, I know there are some plant geeks in the room, so I'm going to briefly go through the plant material selection. Um, it was a combination of woody plants, herbaceous plants. Those are plants that die down to the ground every year but come back, and then grasses. Her, the herbaceous plants in plantings like this are known as forbs horticulturally. Um, I, I really thought that the best way to handle this would be to keep the plant palette to a minimum. I wanted to be able to plant a lot of one thing so that there would be greater impact when it was blooming. Um, and because the space was vast, there, it doesn't look like much from the road, but there are thousands and thousands of plants that went into this planting. And of um, course, Everything that I put in was, is native, and I try not to use cultivars. Cultivars are selections of native plants that might have a better garden performance or a bigger flower. I wanted this to be as native as possible. Um, and I wanted the plants to be extremely tolerant of a wide range of um, water conditions because, as you'll see later in the presentation, this site can go from arid dry in August to the plants being submerged and half submerged in the spring. Um, so let me just, I'll just sort of quickly go through the um, plant material. This is Ilex verticillata, also known as winterberry. Um, any of the local residents probably, if you've driven out to Montauk and gone through the Napig stretch in the late fall and winter, you've seen this plant on the side of the roads. It looks like neon signs sort of in red because the, the red berries are borne heavily on the stems and they sort of define the plant in the landscape. Um, it's, it's really a, a favorite. The berries are also a favorite food for migrating birds in the spring. So they're persistent almost all winter and then the birds get them in the spring when they come back. 
Second woody plant is Clethra alnifolia, also known as sweet pepper bush. Um, major deer food, but the, we, it got hit the first year, but the deer seem to have left it alone now that it's established. Um, August blooming, white, and extremely fragrant. There's um, a native stand of this plant on Sandy Hollow Road in Southampton that you don't, nobody knows it's there until August when it's blooming, July and August. And as you drive by in your car, it's like this amazing air freshener got turned on and there goes the amazing. Um, <laughs> feedback. <laughs> um, the next woody plant is Cephalanthus occidentalis, also known as button bush. You don't see this much on Long Island. It's, it's, I think it likes it a little, warm, a little cooler upstate. But um, this is a cultivar. I, I veered a little bit off of my desires. This one is called, um, not Shake Shack, Sugar Shack. It's, a, it's dwarf. This plant gets to be about 15 feet tall in nature. So this one is a selection that stays a little shorter. But you can see extremely dark green glossy leaves. And it, it, they stay like that all summer long. And this is a late bloomer. This is definitely August, and it's these perfectly spherical, two-inch white globes. Um, and it, it's a, an amazing pollinator food. Um, and now to the herbaceous plants. This is our native iris, iris versicolor, also known as northern blue flag. Um, I want to point out that there's a yellow version of this plant that's actually an exotic invasive. It's an Asian form. And it's extremely invasive and shouldn't be planted in gardens around here. It, it spreads by seed aggressively and is such a bully in the landscape, even in the natural landscape, that it pushes this iris out. Um, the, in the, this is the first plant to bloom in June. It's, it's budding up now. And usually just the middle of June, it starts to flower in this sort of beautiful sky blue color. And then this is the hibiscus palustris. This is really the um, the backbone of the herbaceous planting. This, uh, also known as rose swamp mallow, it's, it's a hardy hibiscus. You, you've seen it a million times all around Georgica Pond. It loves the um, wet areas on the margins of wetlands. Um, and this was what I thought we should have a lot of because it, when it starts blooming in, in the late summer, it's just um, really beautiful. And the winter seed heads of this plant, we leave, um, my company maintains this bioswale also, gratis, um, and we leave the hibiscus up all winter because the seed heads are really beautifully silhouetted and give it a little bit of interest. Um, this is Asclepius incarnata, also known as swamp butterfly weed. I, I wanted to, the reason why I put this in, it was obviously for pollinators. The monarchs are under threat, and this is one of their favorite foods. The Asclepius family in general is um, amazing. It's got a, a lot of different species that some of them thrive in the driest of dry meadows. And then everything in between to this plant that can survive submerged in water in the spring. Um, really good one for bioswale plantings. And now onto the grasses. This is a Chorus Americanus, also known as Sweet Flag. Another plant where there's an Asian form that's most like most um, commonly available in the trade. This was really hard to find. We actually had to have it contract grown for us for the bioswales. But it greens up really early in the spring. If you drive by the bioswale now, it's the, it's the plant with the broad sword-like leaves that are like a more of a celery green compared to the iris. Um, and it, it gets a really interesting flower, something you have to get up close to see, but that's the bloom. Um, to cover that. This is a, another s grass called Juncus effusus. This um, grass is sort of very coarse in texture, um, but it's a real workhorse. Um, it, it establishes very quickly. It roots fast. So it was one of the plants that I used a lot of in the beginning to stabilize the site, especially the edges. Um, it, and during the growing season, it pulls up a lot of water and a lot of those um, soluble chemicals that are coming off of the roads and the landscape. The other good thing about it is that it's evergreen. It gets a little ratty in the winter, but it gives some winter structure to the planting. 
Um, last one is switchgrass, a local, uh, another local meadow grass. It's a warm season grass, so this really kicks in late in the summer. Um, and it's another one that we leave up all winter long because it gets that sort of pretty russet color and just sort of sways in the wind all winter long. Great for wildlife because the, the birds eat the, the seeds in the, during the winter. Um, and this plant, I don't, I, this plant can grow in standing water in pure sand out on Long Beach Road in Sag Harbor. It's, it's also a real workhorse. I don't know how it does it. <laughs> And I threw in last year some carexes, other carexes, carexes just because um, I wanted to see which species would work in this situation. This is tussock sedge. This is the, if any of you were ice skaters on native ponds back in New England, this is the plant that was always coming up out of the ice and it was just like a little thing to sit on to tighten your skates. Because <laughs> when it, it, it's dormant, I mean as it grows it just forms this mound as it gets bigger. and. Um, that's the plant. That's what it looks like in the summer. So let's dig in. Let's talk about how this thing happened. Well, we, uh, we, when we designed the uh, garden, here is the second phase. Is that the second phase there? The first. That's the first phase? This is the first phase. It's still first phase. So we did, we did the first phase, uh, and it was three, these three collection pools here. And um, as we were walking the site after it, was, um, after it was planted, we noticed that the water just meandered down. There was this little tiny stream, and, and we, th that was when we decided we really need to plant that. We really need to, uh, it would be a great, design feature, that's where the water is, and it would also add to the, um, add to the filtering effect of the bioswale. So we went back to the Village Green. We were, really, uh, we were really hesitant because at this point we're actually bisecting visually the Village Green. And um, we thought, well, we just don't know. You know, we've done this, everybody likes it, but this brought on the second wave of anxiety. So and when we, on planting day, this is, this is planting day, and we showed up and there were about 18 inches, there was about 18 inches of water in the front of the little aqueduct things there. And did I mention my amazing team? I said, well guys, let's get the waders on because we have to plant this stuff. Um, and you know, one of the things that we had to do to stabilize the planting because when, the water's running through there, it's, it's almost, it's this little river. We actually took 24 inch bamboo stakes and just put them diagonally through the root balls of the plants into the ground to hold them in place until they were able to root in and establish. So the plants eventually did take hold. This is um, spring of 2017 and um, as with any new planting, the weeds also took hold. So here it is in a very sort of fuzzy green look all throughout. And then we went through and weeded it and cleaned it up. Um, the site actually mistakenly was seeded with turf grass throughout before we planted it. So um, it took a couple of weeding sessions, but we eventually cleaned it out. Another shot in the spring where it was a little drier with the leaves starting to emerge. And then this is as the magic begins. That's when the flowers start to come. The bioswale started to sing, as Edwina would say. <laughs> Summer of 2017, this is the Asclepius incarnata that I was talking about. Nice mauve pink. And... <laughs> I talked about winter interest in the seed heads, the, these little shieldy looking things, that's the, those are the seed pods of the Asclepius. And then the clusters that look like uh, bunches of grapes sort of at the top, that's the, those are the hibiscus seed heads. And that's the Ilex verticillata in bloom, winter bloom. Um, so Stephen touched a little bit on what happened next. Um, that there were basically three pools and the two upper pools were connected on the first phase of planting, but then the site was sort of asking for more. 
Uh, and that's what I think yeah, you can that's expound what I was referring on. To. Yeah, they, so they, we, we wanted to connect the, um, the upper pool to, down to the bottom and actually, as I mentioned, bisect the, 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 uh, the green with, with planting. And um, so far, so good. We, 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 uh, the, the community, we had community acceptance, and uh, everybody liked it. And when we went back to the board, we were a little trepidatious because we thought there might be some resistance to actually uh, planting down the middle. But there wasn't. Um, everybody was enthusiastic, and um, we, we went ahead. This sort of, this, this showed the need. These, this was, um, the water was actually creating this line. I, I can't take credit for <laughs> doing those beautiful curves. Um, we just watched the water flow and went out there one day and put out some flags the way, in the pattern that it was flowing and um, just cut the beds. So now, the, the, another daunting thing was bisecting the village green. So the, um, but now we had a real, a true bioswale. It went from one end to the other and fully planted so that the water was being treated along the way. Sometimes, next. Sometimes the, the water breaches the edges of the swales and goes out into the lawn. <laughs> I'm, we're just trying, I'm just trying to point out here that this area receives a lot of water. It comes from um, all of the road, the road drains. The road runoff, yeah. The ground runoff. From right on the other side of the street, like over here by the library and up Buell Lane. So on a heavy rain, there are tremendous amounts of water flowing through. Here's a shot of, like I said, the plants submer Some of them are completely submerged. Some are half submerged. Um, And oh, this, I just wanted to bring up, you can see there's, there's some debris floating around in that water that would normally either clog up a system or find its way where it shouldn't be. So one of the um, functions of this planting is to capture that stuff in the stems of the plants and hold it in place. It's locking up some carbon and it's keeping, it's just locking that material in place to decompose and actually feed the system. And this is sort of it in its full glory, um, summer of 2018. If there's a saying in the horticulture world, and it, it sort of relates to a child. The first year we weep, the second year we creep, and the third year we leap. And that's, that's so true with any planting tree or even a garden of this stature. It, it, this is um, the, almost the third year of the planting. And you can see that everything is filled in completely. The weeds can't compete against these plants. And, um, it's beautiful. Another art shot. And we did achieve a little bit of habitat here. You can see the, a beautiful paper wasp nest in the, um, I think that's in the Clethra. We've got some bumblebees in, on the Asclepius and the monarch butterflies, of course. This plant was not part of the system, was not part of the planting. That's Eupatorium. Um, it volunteered itself. Nature will do that. And we decided to let it stay because it, it's, a, it's a really valuable wetland plant and it's native. And so you can see what we started with and what we created. Um, and needless to say, the accolades started coming in. Um, um, I think Patty mentioned that the garden and the team was awarded the, uh, the, some, uh, the best community garden by the East Hampton Garden Club. That was, a, that was really an honor, I thought, for us because it was just a bunch of grassroots people sitting in Stephen's kitchen three years ago making it happen. Um, and I just have a funny story. I, I, for my company, I have to buy trucks, and we buy our trucks in Quag at Otis Ford. And I don't know, the locals will know Jeffrey Plitt. He works there. So I went in to sign papers. I, I, there's somebody else in the company who buys the trucks, but I just go in to sign. And Jeffrey's like, Tony Piazza, are you the guy who worked on that planting in the village green? I said, yeah, I am. And he's like, I drive by that thing twice a day. I love it. It's the highlight of my day. It makes me happy in the morning and cheers me up on the way home. <laughs> and that was our goal. <laughs>
another before and after shot. Um, I, I wanted to just take a second to talk about public-private public -private partnerships, which this project was. It was the municipality and generous um, residents and concerned citizens coming together to make it happen. Probably the, the, the greatest example of public-private partnership is Central Park, um, where the Central Park Conservancy was formed and worked with the city to bring the park back to life. Um, this is a small example of that here, but it, um, every little bit helps. Um, there have been several field trips to the bioswale when it was in bloom from the, the East Hampton Middle School. So it's really, it's a great community outreach thing. Um, so aesthetically, horticulturally, the design was a success. But what about its real effects on water? That's what we're really concerned about. And I want to turn it over to Colleen, who is a data geek, <laughs> but has some really, really interesting facts on how this thing is performing. I love bringing the data. So we have been collecting water quality samples um, comprehensively since the garden, since before the garden was planted within the Village Green Bioswale through Surf Rider Foundation's Blue Water Task Force program. This is a 20-year-old program. There are over 50 labs. Um, and it's a national network of citizen scientists who help provide critical water quality information to the community to protect public health at the, at the beach and also connect um, stakeholders to help implement solutions to these water quality problems. So we run this program locally. We collect samples from 50 locations year round. That is weekly in the summertime, so you can imagine how much work that is bi-weekly in the spring and the fall and monthly in the winter to gather baseline data. Our local partners are the concerned citizens of Montauk. They operate their most East Hampton locations and they bring them out to their lab in Montauk. And then we partner with Peconic Baykeeper to help run our Southampton lab within Dr. Christopher Gobler's lab at Stony Brook Southampton. Um, and our sampling plan was designed to complement the data that Suffolk County Department of Health Services provides due to restricted resources and distance of how long Long Island is, um, they're only able to sample registered bathing beaches, so that's anywhere with a lifeguard stand, once a month, maybe twice a month during the summertime. So we are really trying to fill in those data caps because we know that we have a lot of visitors and we have a lot of people using the water um, and a lot of people using the water in a lot of places that are not registered bathing beaches. So we help to provide information to the community about um, whether the water is safe to swim in or not. And we test for a fecal bacteria called Enterococcus, which indicates human or animal waste in the watershed. And this is the same method that the county uses as well, so our data is comparable to theirs. Um, and we share our data online. I left little cards on the back table back there if anyone's interested in getting water quality alert emails, I can sign you up with that so you can receive water quality alerts right in your inbox. Um, I just wanted to point out these are our sampling locations within the watershed. So the southernmost green point you can see is Hook Pond South to the right. That's on, off of Dune Mirror Lane. Uh, right above that is the Duck Pond. <laughs> you can imagine how the water is there. <laughs> um, just above that is the Methodist Lane Swale. And then Going back down right above where it says Maidstone Club, that's the village green, and then the yellow dot is the town pond. Um, so in order to understand the data, bear with me, I know this is a lot of science, but I promise I'll make it understandable. <laughs> um, in order to understand the data, I just wanted to point out we use an EPA recommended methodology. It's called the IDEX Quanti Tray method. I know that probably needs doesn't mean anything to anyone, but just wanted to point out that's the method that we use, and we compare our results to the EPA recre Recreational Water Quality Health Standard of 104 colony forming units of Enterococcus. Um, so we'll be referencing throughout this the sample count, which is pretty obvious, the amount of samples we were able to collect, the geometric mean, which should it's basically a way to standardize the data because water quality data can be very variable. Um, so it's basically a way to standardize the data and um, account for outliers. And we'll also be referencing the EPA health standard of 104. And I just want to point out that we collect samples at the Village Green only when there is water pooled, right? 
logically. <laughs> um, so whenever we go out sampling, we'll drive by the Village Green and see if there's water pooled there. And if there is, we'll collect a sample. So um, eight, we started collecting samples eight months prior to the planting. We were able to collect seven samples with a geometric mean of 4,030. So the geometric mean should not exceed 35 colony forming units of enterococcus as per the swimming health, the swimming standard. Obviously no one's swimming in there, so this is good news. <laughs> um, after one year of the garden being planted, we were able to collect six samples and the geometric mean was 321. And then two years after the garden was planted, we were able to collect, or sorry, within the second year of the garden being planted, we were able to collect four samples with a geo mean of 891. So, I know it might seem like the bacteria levels went up a lot, but we had a very wet spring last year, if you all remember. It rained a lot. You can see in the pictures, it rained a lot, a lot, a lot last year. So um, I just want to make this make a little bit more sense to you. So we, I just showed you the sample count of the amount of samples we were able to collect at the bioswale, but I, then I compared it to the Georgica Beach Association, that's basically the ocean beach right in front of Georgica Association, because that's collected on the same sampling run. So what I did here is I compared the amount of samples we were able to take at the bioswale versus the amount of samples we were able to take at Georgica, or we took at Georgica. So you can see before the planting in those seven months, we collected seven samples at the bioswale and 15 at the Georgica Beach, which is so 47% of the time there was water pooled up at the bioswale. During, after, during the first year of the planting, we were able to collect six samples at the bioswale and 26 at Georgica Beach Association. So t water was pooled up at the bioswale 23% of the time. And during the second year, we were able to collect four samples only at the bioswale, collecting 23 at Georgica Beach, and water was only pulled up 70% of the time. So what this shows is that there's a decrease in the percentage of times that there's water being pulled up at the bioswale. So that's really good news. <laughs> um, I just wanted to give you all, an ex well, show you all the comprehensive data we have for this bioswale. So this, when you're, when you're referencing a single sample, you're looking at that 104 number. So these numbers need to be compared to 104. So if you see, before we planted the garden, we were getting some alarming, alarming bacteria levels. Um, and very, very frequently, some in the 10,000s. So you can see over time that the bacteria levels have decreased. And I just want to point out that Yes, we are still getting high bacteria levels in here, but water only pools up in the bioswale after a very, very heavy rain after the first flush, which is when everything gets picked up from the roadways and all of that stormwater is being brought down. But if you notice, there is a much less percentage of time that the, that the bioswale is actually being connected to the town pond. So this bioswale is functioning. We can't say to statistically that the data is proving that the water quality has gotten better, because if there are any other data nerds in here, you know you need 30 samples. We don't have 30 quite yet. Hopefully we won't even be able to get them, because the bioswale is just absorbing all the water. But this is showing a good trend. So the next thing we did was we started collecting samples at the Methodist Lane Swale. So this is behind the Methodist Church, across the street from the, the post office and CVS, um, kind of next to the train tracks. Does everyone know where this is? Nods? That's good. Um, so we started collecting samples there because this area is just planted with grass. So we were curious to see what the water quality was like there. Um, so what I did next was I compared the amount of, or the amount of times that we sampled, meaning there was water pooled at the Methodist Lane swale versus the village green bioswale. So you can see that over time, as the roots of that bioswale have established, there's water being pooled in the area that's only grass way more frequently than the swale where there are actually plants being able, the roots of those plants are able to absorb that water. Can so, I, can I interject one? Yes. I just want the audience to understand that the village green and the Methodist Lane sites were both graded at the same time. Mm -hmm. Way back in, was it 2016? They were all part of the same project. So, bioswale is working. 
there is less water there, and that's exactly what we want, therefore reducing urban runoff. So let's bring this full circle. Remember, we are all within a watershed. Or. So there's a, fa there's a phase two, folks. OK. Um, yeah, there is a phase two. This is called the exit through the gift store <laughs> moment. Um, no, um, the, the original plantings were <coughs> such a success and Village Green that we talked to LVIS and thought that maybe we should tackle Methodist Lane now to sort of um, beautify that area and um, make it, maybe make it, it's a, it's a much more aggressive project because we want to make it more of an educational um, destination for the community as well as um, something that looks good. So here's the plan for the new bioswale, and I'll just briefly go through this. Um, it incorporates four to five different um, ecosystems that are native to, I'm sorry? Sorry? Okay. Um, so do you know where CVS and the post office are? Across the street, all the way back right to the cemetery, past the survivor tree. It's that area that sort of, Right by the railroad tracks, yes. By the mailboxes where you by the drop in your mail. That's Methodist Lane. Yes. Yep. So we, we're going to incorporate another swale here, a bioswale, which is represented in blue. We want to do a Long Island native meadow, a pollinator garden, and um, plant some native trees, some tupelos and sweet gums. Um, so we get the full package of the environmental concerns here. And it's something that you can see there's a bridge over the bioswale, and there may be some casual paths mowed through the, the um, meadow from time to time. There's a seating area with a bench. Um, that's, that's, our, that's our next <coughs> plan for expansion. Um, and this, it, it's kind of a, this area is a little messy right now, so it would be good to clean it up because it sort of incorporates the um, hook pond, I mean the hook mill, the Survivor Tree Memorial and um, the veterans Cemetery Memorial. And the Veterans Memorial. The Veterans right. Memorial, right. And it's also where the drop-off mailboxes are. So people drive by there a lot every day. <laughs> um, so it's time to wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, we just wanted to show you a really quick video of the garden during a very heavy rain, showing what this garden is actually doing. Yeah, this is um, late spring after a heavy rain. You can see the bubbles coming up around the plants. Um, that's showing the percolation that's going on. The, the, the water is displacing the air in the soil. Um, and the, the plants are submerged and surviving. And the water sort of gently moves through there now. It's not a rushing torrent as it was in the beginning. Um, it's, it's time to thank some people again. Of course, all the partners, um, LVIS, Mahoney Farms, KW Cassidy Foundation, the Michelle Walbert Foundation, um, Surf Rider Foundation, and the Peconic Baykeepers. And there are a few people I'd like to call out and mention um, that were part of this project and a little bit in the background. And it, it's Ann Thomas, Patty Farron, and Livy Brooks that are, were our committee people from Elvis that were with us from this in the beginning. And I think without their support and their enthusiasm and their love of the village, we wouldn't be sitting here today. Um, Tom Nero from Surf Rider Foundation, there's always a money man involved. And he kept all the finances straight for us. And um, Becky Molinaro from the village, she's the... Um, assistant to the mayor. She's the administrator. The yes, administrator. and um, would not have been, this project would not have happened without Becky being the liaison between the community and the municipality. And that's it.
Oh, that's a great question. It, it's, it's fully scalable. Um, you know, the, as a matter of fact, the design for Methodist Lane is it could be something as small as a swale or it could be expanded to the upland and lowland wetland regions too. Um, help me, I don't know. <laughs> it, yeah. it, it, these, these situations are completely scalable. You have to assess the environment, find the right plant material, and find the problem and address it. And these are meant to be demonstration gardens. So these are meant to be educational to inspire folks to do it on their own properties to show that it is possible and it is beautiful and it's possible to be to have organic landscaping practices in a way that helps the water and also helps you because you get to enjoy it. You know, I had some, uh, I did a little traveling this winter and I was in the Pacific Northwest in Eureka, California visiting a friend and every parking lot that I went to had a bioswale in the middle of it. All of the cars parked facing the bioswale so all of and some of them had multiple. So there's like zero runoff happening from these parking lots. We're really behind the times here on the East Coast with this situation. Um, I just have a, two questions, actually. So the water runs from the flagpole. So it runs really from the Methodist Church or actually from North Main Street, the, the river that runs under North Main Street. Okay. Right? So you, it's running down towards Hook Pond, which goes into the ocean. You caught us, but yes. There are actually That's a couple well. of watersheds coming into play. Um, I think the water, most of the water that comes down into Methodist Lane is actually coming from as far up as Three Mile Harbor Road, right. the top of Three Mile Harbor. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Village Green Bioswale accepts water from a slightly different area, but as well as parts of the, the small watershed that we showed in our picture. Ends up in the same place. It all ends up in the ocean. Ocean, yeah. <laughs> One another question: Why, in um, the turn of the century, the LVS could have parties on the Village Green, and um, lately, that you know, before you did your project, even now, it's too wet. I just was. That's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I as a kid, I always wondered how ruins happened. Like, how did Rome get buried? <laughs> Things change, you know, grade, grades, so soil grade changes over time. And as things are deposited, things get built up. So um, I don't know exactly how it happened at the Village Green, but it, it's just change over time, basically. And it's... Right. Right, drainage pipes that silted in. Um, and you know, people, there, there are infrastructure projects that get done to, to handle drainage water, and they, sometimes they get forgotten about. After 50 years, it's like, oh yeah, there's a pipe that empty. It's, it, it's amazing how that happens. And, Just much more paving. Right, more paving, more runoff. More hardscape. More roofs. Um, I have, um, uh, I, like, um, First of all, thank you. This was wonderful. Um, do you have a design concept in mind for boat ramps? Because um, I see a number of boat ramps. There's one in my neighborhood where the water floods down. And um, as far as places, I mean, it's a clear, direct route. Yeah, right that, out of the parking. And, yeah, and, so. And um, direct shot. So, I, so I ask with enthusiasm and hope. Um, <laughs> thank you. It's a good question. I, I don't, but I'd love to work on it. Our <laughs> partners, Peconic Baykeeper. Um, Baykeeper is this national organization of water keepers. They have a green marinas program. So I don't know if that's part of their program, but that very well could be. So I would look into that. Thank you. I want to ask you a couple of things. Is swamp rose the same as milkweed? No, they're, they're two different plants. attract the bees because I've been a beekeeper for 45 years and I'm very concerned about what's going on with all these pesticides. They okay, are well, ruining. I'm with you, sister. I'm a beekeeper as well. <laughs> and almost, almost anything that flowers is going to help honeybees. So um, I, the, I have stopped at the bioswale in July and when the Asclepius was in bloom and it was covered with honeybees. So um, anything that's making nectar and pollen is pretty much going to be food for the bees. Last question, right. you stand up, 
Absolutely. Th that would be called a buffer planting or a buffer zone. And, um, you know, sometimes you don't see the water moving, but it could be moving underground. It, it could be seeping in and just hitting the water table and moving laterally through. So the, it's, the, it's like the planting the edge of a bioswale, so to say. It's, it's called a buffer zone. Everybody who lives on the water should do that. Right, Sarah? <laughs> we want to thank, thank Stephen, Colleen, and Tony for a fabulous presentation. Thank you, thank you. Very much.